right, welcome back to another episode of the School of Why podcast. We've got someone live in the studio, Mr. Destin Ortego. How are you, Destin? I'm doing great, Frankie. How are you? I'm doing well today, man. I, uh, I'm excited about having you uh, on the show. I've been We've been meaning to get together for some time. I think you just went through a massive um, renovation and, and moving of, of, of your uh, opportunity machine, right? Yeah. Is that what it's called? Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. Tell us a little bit about kind of what it is that, that you do and, and why it's so important to you. And it, you've kind of turned it, I think, into your life's purpose, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah, 100%. And, uh, and so, yeah, so we just moved from uh, Light, the Louisiana, uh, uh, or L-I-T-E, which is anyone who's familiar with Lafayette. It's a big glowing egg across from the Cajun Dome, you know. Uh, but place. it was really like a tech center, and, and it was great. Great space for us to be in, uh, but we well, found and, that and, a lot of the tech startups want to be downtown. Right? Did they? Okay. Yeah. Now, what 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 exactly were you doing in the egg? Sure. So we ran an incubator. So Opportunity Machine is an incubator, five hundred one c six membership based nonprofit that we run as a business incubator, and it's which is really basically just, like uh, startup businesses. Correct. What, what, what it, for those of people yeah. who out there don't know what an incubator is, other than a uh, place where you get chickens' eggs to uh, hatch or whatever. What's an what's a business incubator? Do you hatch sure. eggs there? Yeah, no. So, well, I mean, if the egg is the idea, okay. <laughs> then possibly, yeah. Uh, but we bring startups in, whether they're mom and pop lifestyle businesses or high growth potential high growth startups, and come in and, and provide them with resources and space. So, co working spaces. It's not just co working, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but an accelerator program, which I'll get into later, which is actually set programming. It's not just that either. So, the incubator is kind of a combination of the two. Uh, where people can come in and they can get access to professional workspace mm -hmm. at a very low rate and also get access to mentorship and programming that helps them understand how to market their business or how to do their taxes even. Uh, and so that's historically what we've been in operation of is kind of educating people on a lot of the basics of starting up a business. Interesting. Okay, that that's really that's really good stuff. So what is it like does the business have to qualify? Is it is it a certain type of business and does it cost them money? How does that work mm -hmm. with incubators? Sure. So in the move to our new facility downtown, we've restructured a lot of things and okay. we're shifting our focus to be more towards the high growth startups, right? Uh, the ones that are very scalable, the business model can really scale. They might be seeking venture capital or angel investment, um, not really likely to go after uh, a small business bank loan or something like that. Gotcha. Uh, and so they apply to get in and we have a board that reviews the applications and then based on the potential for the business, how many jobs they could potentially create quality jobs is really important too. Cause we do have a strong uh, tie in with the local economic development organization. Okay. And, uh, and is that normal for economic development to be involved in these types of initiatives? Yeah. So I think if you'd go to any, or at least any of the economic development uh, you know, seminars that I've been to in the last, you know, six, seven years, uh, they typically talk about three legs of economic development. And you have the business recruitment and expansion. You, or, sorry, you have the business recruitment, you have the business retention and expansion, and then you have growth from within, which is typically what an incubator would do or some sort of entrepreneurial support system uh, where we work with people that are already in the community to help them start ideas and then grow those into businesses. That's awesome. Now, how did you get into this space and i mean this isn't a very like normal space to jump into i know that here in lafayette it's something that um you know we we, we wasn't always there yeah. right and there wasn't this you know you called it an entrepreneurial ecosystem yeah. um do you feel like you've created that or we've created that in, in this town now yeah well i mean an entrepreneurial ecosystem just like anything can always be better i think as long as you have two at least two entrepreneurs <laughs> or an entrepreneur and somebody who wants to support that entrepreneur within the community. And you can kind of say that you're starting, uh, you're incubating almost a, a, okay. an ecosystem. Uh, but really I think it's grown tremendously over the last few years. And then I think it's really about to catch momentum and it's kind of like a, a flywheel is like, uh, you know, the faster it spins, the faster it, it just catches that momentum. And so once you, bring on more investment, more capital, you have more entrepreneurs who are coming into the system. Uh, if you look at it from a standpoint of you have one startup that is really successful, and then when they sell the company or they do an exit or whatever, you'll have people who will spin off from that and start up their own companies. And then five people who spin off from there start five different companies and then they bring in people and they teach them how to start companies and then they exit and then they do that again. And pretty soon you have, you know, 20 startups uh, that, 
you know, almost all of them had talent that stemmed off from one of the original ones, right? And so it's just about building that momentum and to build out that ecosystem. Yeah. So what are some of the companies that you've worked with, you know, over the years that you you really saw like this whole the whole thing go through like that you would think of as kind of a case study for the opportunity machine um, that went through the whole model um, and and you've seen some you've seen them really succeed. What, what, what does that look like? Sure. So, I mean, as far as going through the whole model, like I said, we changed a lot of that and okay. uh, and I can talk about why we changed that and i'll use waiter as a as an example right okay. so waiter um you know food delivery last mile delivery you know company but uh specialized in food delivery you know they came in and they had actually started uh in a town called lake charles right uh you know about an hour and a half or so away from lafayette but the second market they came into was lafayette so whenever they came to lafayette they found out about the opportunity machine they were like hey you know we really need this support uh, we're currently raising some friends and family rounds you know but we're really trying to grow the business mm -hmm. and uh, and get some more, more support for that so they came in and we worked with them and it was really just about connecting them with resources and one thing i have to uh, give chris super props on is that he did everything he could to figure out every single resource that was potentially available to him even if it wasn't something that was going to work with him or be a good fit at that moment and then he just like, whether he made a list of it, I don't know how he organized it all, uh, but he just knew at that point in time after he had found out about it, when was going to be the best time to then re-engage with that resource or whether to use it then or whether to use components of it. You know, So he really was able to take all the resources that were available to him as a startup in Lafayette, Louisiana, hmm. and then create that roadmap of like when to engage with those resources and when to activate those resources. Uh, so that that's one of the things that we really helped out with, helped them give uh, some space and then you know, then they made the switch from, uh, you know, headquarters into Lafayette. That's awesome. Yeah. And I know, you know, Waiter's one of the one of the few companies that have really built a product and, and exited, uh, you know, as you know, 360, the one that I built, mm -hmm. we recently exited to a Fortune 500. And, you know, we, we found that um, it, there were some really great things about being in Lafayette. Uh, building a product company here and then there were some some drawbacks so one of the great things about Lafayette is that we don't have as much competition for product mm -hmm. companies mm -hmm. um, that's also a drawback because we don't have as much talent necessarily to pull from um, so a lot of it has to be kind of homegrown you really do have to be a little scrappier yep. um, is that kind of one of the things that opportunity machine I know you guys spent you know got some a lot of money over a million dollars I think to, to build that amazing building uh, which congratulations by the way thank you um, you know that um, is that gonna is that designed to try to change that like to to create something for Lafayette in this community that's an unsuspecting community right for product um, is that designed to impact that at, at all as far as to attract more talent here and things like that oh yeah absolutely okay. I think one of the things Great. that we're starting to see especially after post pandemic uh, as far as attracting talent it's harder and harder to attract talent it's harder and harder to attract companies whether they're uh, in the early stages or in later stages because a lot of people are able to work remotely or they're they're able to do things that they weren't able to do before uh, from a farther distance, mm -hmm. right? And do it just as efficiently or effectively, right? So what we're, a lot of what we're repurposing our focus on is while we still want to re attract talent from outside, yeah. we're trying to build up the talent that we have here mm -hmm. and help them understand the processes, give them the tools that they need to be mm -hmm. very successful. Because if they create jobs and opportunities for other people, then that's one of the better ways to attract people. And then also they're going to add to the quality of life as well. Yeah, that makes total sense. I mean, I think the biggest thing that I've learned over the years is that um, – you know, when you have create something like you guys have created, it is so important. They have multiple things that um, are being affected. I mean, for you, how important is it uh, to have people being in the office? I know there's a lot of like real, a lot of controversy around that. I'm sure you guys are kind of on the cutting edge of that. What do you feel like is 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 the answer to that? I, my guess is you're going to say like hybrid or something yeah. like that. And and what, what is what do you think good hybrid, you know, work uh from home versus working at, at an office or an incubator look like sure so well I, I mean for me i probably have one of the more unpopular answers which is uh i like going into the office to get my work done uh because it's where i keep all my whiteboards yeah, me too. you know yeah. all my books all my reference material uh, i set up my office for 
creativity and, and mapping out processes and, and problem solving, right? Whereas uh, at home, I don't really have that option. You know, I got two kids um, or one's on the way. So we're like clearing everything out and I'm, I'm mm -hmm. ending up with less and less space, yeah. right? Classic. But um, what we're hearing from the companies that we work with, uh, for instance, we, ha we have one company that, you know, they probably come in and most of their employees are there almost every day, right? But mm -hmm. they all love to be there. It's just a really good community vibe and everybody yeah. being around each other. Mm -hmm. But then another company that we work with that's still very successful in hiring just as many people might say, well, we're there, you know, twice a week, you know, but when we're there, we're there for a collaborative experience. Uh, and when everyone else is out needing to do the administrative tasks or doing sales calls or whatever, they can go and do that from their home. Right? Yeah, I see it. That's what I, I, I think. It's the same thing. You know, at the end of the day, I think what what works the best is that if we are going to do this office thing, that it's intentional. Right. I think the days of successful companies just like having this I this kind of stigma or idea or um, kind of innate thing that we expect you just to be at the office this is just the way it is kind of thing i think that's that's dying a bit mm -hmm. um it was already dying but it was a lot more progressive to, to allow work from home i know it wasn't something that i was comfortable with at 360 ia sure. uh but it, but after covid now like i mean it, it, it's something that it doesn't bother me really at all but it is something good to to have um, intentionality on what we do when we're here. So I think that's good that with the collaboration. I like that. And your space is perfect for that uh, because yep. it's basically a collaborative space, you know. You know, switching gears before uh, before we wrap, I, I just wanted to kind of get uh, a, a, if, an idea from you. What, what's something that you felt like is a life hack that you've used to harness um, emotions especially around work and life and I know that you deal with a lot of stresses you're under a lot of pressure um, mm -hmm. with with what you do what's what's one kind of life hack or something that you do to help really kind of create a more balanced authentic life at both work and at the office sure so I, I feel like this is probably uh, I don't want to say it's a standard answer because I don't see it a lot but whenever I see it you know everyone's uh, upvoting it or <laughs> whatever but uh, time blocking is something I've recently done, and, and I've already known about it for a while, but I've uh, just recently gotten to the practice where I'm like forced myself to because it kind of yeah. one of those things that you have mm. to build up a habit mm. around it. Yeah. But instead of just creating this massive to do list of things, um, you know, I still have my to do list, but I make sure if there's anything that needs to get done within the the you know next couple of weeks that I literally go in and I, I block time for that. And that's not just for work, but it's literally like for creative time you know just time to kind of like brainstorm basically, things so so are you saying you're basically blocking time blocking not everybody really know what that means but sure. i'm assuming what it is is it's basically scheduling time like basically meetings with yourself to do things with yourself to get putting it in the calendar to get stuff done to basically yeah. work on your project or work on your business instead Absolutely. of just in it yeah. Okay. So like I got an office administrator, uh, you know, who's amazing at what she does. And but she sees a time, you know, that's open in my schedule and somebody is requesting with it. You know, she knows that I like to not keep people waiting. So she might like block it in there. But if I'm not careful, you know, yes. and I get enough meeting requests then I'm not going to be able to spend time to work on Dude, the things I need to work on. Yeah, right? it's funny you mentioned that I've had to do the same thing, you know, especially now I'm, I'm working with a l much larger organization now that the company got bought out. And it, they, everybody just kind of works off the calendar, yeah. you know, and I, and I also don't use a secretary anymore after selling the company. So I've been getting into Calendly and some of these like, yeah. like smarter solutions. And you're right. If you're not careful, like you're just getting booked. Mm -hmm. It's like, whoa, 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 wait a it's second. It's convenient, <laughs> but then it can create a whole new slew yeah, you of have problems, to have a right? System. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I've had to do the same thing. Well, that's really good. And, and you know, what would you say for you? How old are you now? I'm 38. 38. Okay. So what would you say is f for you was maybe a breaking point um, in your adult life or maybe it was before you were an adult, but it was a breaking point for you that really kind of created who you are today. I call it breaking why from the book, but basically it, it it's what kind of gave you the inspiration or the direction of, of okay, this is my purpose or where I want to go with this. Usually there's some sort of a breaking point or something that that's not working that needs a solution or something along those lines. What would you say for you that was? Yeah. Well, I was a musician for a long time. Uh, and 
You know, I love the creative aspect. I was, uh, oh man, it was it was heavy stuff. You know, we call it a uh, southern metal? southern hardcore. <laughs> oh God! There was a singing, there was a screaming, all that stuff. <laughs> Played Warp Tour, South by Southwest. Uh, really, Warp yeah, Tour? Yeah, yeah. I was in a band once and did South by Southwest two or three times. Never yeah. Warp Tour. It wasn't heavy enough. So yeah. you guys actually did all that. Yeah, yeah. I played it a couple times, but uh, it's, uh, you know, it it was one of those things where I came to a realization after like getting close to talking to uh you know Record labels label. about signing mm -hmm. on and things like that and then coming into the understanding of like this is what it's actually like to be in this industry yeah you know and having friends who i thought i considered had made it because they were playing this massive That's tours right. and then they're still trying to figure out if they wanted to pay their apartment bill or if they want to play their phone bill you yep. know and having to decide between the it's two crazy you know, it kind of like brings some stuff into you. And at the time I was 28, 29 and I was like, you know what? I don't want to be mm -hmm. like, even if we got signed today and everything worked out for us, it would still be five, six years down the road before I could say I would probably consider a success. And that's if everything went right. Exactly. And then I was just like, I don't want to be 35 figuring that out, whether or not that, you know, oh. I hit it. It's unbelievable. So, yeah, for me, I was 23. I had the, almost the exact same moment. I was like, I am just tired of starving to death. Mm -hmm. That's actually when I started my first company. So I was just like, okay, I'm just going to. And it's funny. They sh I found a postcard from my first company. It was in the real estate finance industry mm -hmm. before the mortgage crisis. That's, we'll have to tell you that story another time. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> there's a postcard. And it, I still had, like, long hair down to here in the postcard, but I'd thrown a suit on. I was like, I'm a mortgage <laughs> broker now. And it's just it's hilarious because I, like, hadn't even really fully – morphed out of my like uh you know guitar player ca cape oh yeah um it's and we, a process <laughs> yeah and, and you know it's it's crazy because i went through the exact same thing and it's like you know i have a company that i invested in called artist tone records and it's with mark broussard mm -hmm. and he's a perfect example of somebody who had was signed with atlantic and all these different companies and and is very successful yeah uh, but he still has is on the road you yeah. know he's still still out there and he's done multiple albums i mean this guy it uh, him and I think Lauren Daigle are probably uh, the most successful people that have come out here. And then the Givers, mm -hmm. they're all successful, but none of them. I can't speak for Lauren Daigle, but I know with Mark and the Givers, you know, I'm closer mm -hmm. with them. And um, it's it's not automatic, yeah. you know. And I was talking to you before we we got on today. You know, it's the same thing with the book business. Just because you have a great book, you're not making a bunch of money on a book. Just like with the musicians' albums, mm -hmm. so if you're not on tour, you know, you're not making a bunch of money, which is why you know speaking and doing keynotes and th being a thought leader is how you do it with the book world but as an author in uh nonfiction, but you know it's interesting how that that was so that was a big part of your journey then huh yeah that's, as far as like, i mean that's pretty much how i kind of relate it to what i do today right is that i i find myself being and you know i had a couple other little startups that uh you know tried worked on but i think that's what makes it me so passionate about working with startups right mm -hmm. because it's a shift in career and like, okay, like the music I liked, but I didn't really like all the other aspects of it. But working with startups, it's not an overnight success, even right. if it looks like one That's from right. everyone else's perspective. Like, wow, this company like really blew up. Now, have you ever heard that it takes seven years to have an overnight success? Yeah. 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 And, 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 and in pretty, fact, it's actually pretty accurate. You might get the, there in five and a half years, but that's pretty quick. Yeah. And then some of the data that we're looking at, it's like 9.7 years to yeah. have a successful exit if you get to that point. If right? you get to an exit. That's yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, and I've owned from, a lot of companies. I've only had one exit. Yeah. And, it, and the only reason I had an exit on, on the company that I recently sold was because when I started the company, it was because I knew I would exit. Mm -hmm. And I had some ideas of who I was going to exit to. Mm hmm you see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's crazy. And I ended up exiting to the people I thought. Like, if you don't have that type of mindset, uh, you you will miss the mark. Yeah. Um, and it's so easy to do. I think a lot of companies, what they do is they, uh, they, they, they believe so much in their product. They believe so much in their company that they miss the moment where they should have exited. And they end up with uh, kind of like because they're like they know it's possible and the potential. But there's so many pieces in the economy and. There's so many moments that, that have to line up for it to be right. And sometimes I think as a founder, you almost have to feel like you're leaving some on the table. Absolutely. You yeah, all, yeah. If you don't feel like you're leaving some on the table, you probably waited too long. Um, or you you just – some people get lucky and they get these big numbers. But, I, you know, you see it all the time. These big companies, they, they're, they're amazing companies. They don't exit or they don't go public. And then next thing you know, it's, uh, you know, they're gone. Yeah. You know, they, they, they missed they missed the window. So have yeah. you seen that with any uh, companies that you work with? Uh, not like specifically, because I, I think a lot of the I mean, 
you know, outside of waiter, I think waiter's kind of what really kicked off a lot of the interest momentum. in that and That's momentum right. in our area. Well, wasn't it like uh, three hundred million or something like that? Yeah. For, uh, well, let's see. I'm trying to remember. So they raised. 26 million i want to say is, is about the number 26 million just in louisiana before they you know um got acquired and exactly. uh and which then, that is a that is a big difference that's one thing that i've been looking into more because um you know a lot of companies they just will bootstrap it like i did mine but i, I had another company that funded the bootstrap mm -hmm. that i already already owned mm -hmm. so that really helped but if you don't have a funding mechanism um it's a little bit different but i know yeah. with those guys I, I i didn't realize how much when you see these big numbers, these exits, how much of it is is actually already like kind of like spoken for from all of the raises and everything oh, else? Oh yeah, absolutely. So I'm guessing you guys really help educate the the little guys that are coming to the incubator on that, huh? On, yeah. on how to maneuver that stuff. Yeah, we have. Thankfully, we have a lot, especially with with Waiter and some of the other companies that have come in. Uh, I know you mentioned Mark Graffinini earlier, and and some of the other people who've come in and really like wanted to support the entrepreneurial ecosystem here in Lafayette yeah. because they see a lot of good talent coming out and they're like, well, we want to jump on board with this, you know, and be a part of that as it's growing and getting momentum. Um, is that uh, it's not, you know, thankfully we don't have to be an expert in everything. Me and myself, mm -hmm. I mean, you just, you just can't, you know, so we just bring in all these other people who have done it, live their daily lives, you know, have uh, a lot of use cases and success stories around that. And then what we really try to focus on as far as like OM specifically um, outside of the mentorship is just trying to help people de-risk ideas uh, and get through ideas as fast mm. as possible. Like the studies that we've Feel seen. fast, basically. It show, yeah, so we've seen some studies that show it takes about 1,000 ideas and about 16,000 hours of vetting through those 1,000 ideas to get to 20 potentially investable ideas. And then less than 11 of those will be considered a success by wow. an, an actual investor, right? Uh, and that's so, super important information for a newcomer, yeah. you know, who's thinking that, that, that they're like three ideas is gonna, one of those. Is, is the is the one yeah you know it's easy to get into that mindset and then if it's not one of the first three to five or maybe even ten mm -hmm. we're a failure you know yeah and it's that idea of like okay we're going to create a culture where failing fast is acceptable and where we're not going to look at it as a failure at all right no and no i mean if it's a three quoting, year uh we're just going to keep quoting how many light bulbs uh yeah with, if, it, if it's a three-year process to fail to then that's it. that's a that's a a potentially bad metric but if it's a six month process to fail and then you can spend the rest of the two and a half years that you would have spent you know on something that might succeed then uh you know yeah it's important to get through that i love that yeah so you know it sounds like you've really built a uh a a, a, a purposeful uh organization where everything that you guys do is really about others and supporting others and seeing others succeed which i think is incredible and Thank i think you. it's starting to pay off i love love the building and whatnot you know, um, the the biggest thing that I, I, I always talk to people about whenever we're, we're, we're conversating with this whole concept of the school of why is like, what am I doing to really give back or to mentor and help others? And I love that the Opportunity Machine has kind of made that their core value, you know. So I guess before you go, what, what what's next and what are people, how do businesses that might be watching this or listening um how do they connect or get started with something like an incubator or accelerator like opportunity machine sure yeah so you can go to opportunitymachine.org okay uh, we're redoing our website right now but you can go through there and get some uh some basic information we're launching our accelerator program uh in july actually uh, our first cohort kicks off july 7th Oh, so that'll be your first accelerator program yeah well so we've done a healthcare accelerator program before but it was right. more structured around creating partnerships between the startups and larger healthcare systems and okay. so this accelerator program is going to be that like the innovate south winner kind of thing yeah that was, so that was opportunity health that okay. led into innovate south innovate south being our conference where uh you know we had the medical pitch competition of course yeah. yeah absolutely but this one's more focused it's not focused on any specific industry it's just you come in with an idea and as long as you fall within uh, idea stage to you know like early seed stage uh where you were you know you really haven't found that product market fit mm -hmm. that's the process that we're trying to get you through is giving you all the tools you know understanding the jobs to be done defining customer profiles understanding your assumptions about your business model canvas uh and then doing customer discovery discovery uh, to validate or invalidate uh, your assumptions about your business and de-risk it as much as possible. I love that. Well, man, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank it's, you for it's, having me. It's always a pleasure to get to chat with you, and I'm, I'm so excited to see what happens next for Opportunity Machine. So, you know, and, until next time, um, you're listening to the School of Why podcast. <laughs>